let's think about criticisms of intelligent design. And in particular, criticisms of intelligent design that come from evolutionary theory uh, and uh, the, uh, the way evolutionary theory has been developed uh, over the last uh, century and a half to explain all sorts of uh, phenomena in the biological realm. So two major uh, things to remember. One is that as uh, evolutionary theory has developed and been uh, pursued by biologists, they've been able to explain uh, more and more phenomena using evolutionary theory. And the other thing to remember is that many of the things that were previously thought to be irreducibly complex structures have in turn uh, come to be explained by evolutionary theory. For example, the eye. We now have very detailed accounts of how eyes developed in organisms, not just once on Earth, but dozens of independent times. Evolutionary pressure on having eyes for organisms is very intense, and the development of the eye across a wide range of different organisms and a wide range of different times, each independently of the others, is now well documented and pretty easy to establish. So we have good reason to think that evolutionary theory can explain complex structures whose parts uh, are each individually necessary in order for that structure to function properly. If you take, a, uh, take away one of those parts, then the structure, structure fails to function. How does evolutionary theory explain the development of complex structures like this? Well, there's a number of different ways of, uh, uh, that biologists have done it, but a sort of rough characterization goes like this. The parts can develop, evolve, independently because the function of some uh, particular part of an organism can change depending on the other parts of the organism and depending on the environment in which that organism finds itself. So it might turn out that, and often does turn out, that the parts that eventually come together to form what seems like an irreducibly complex structure actually have independent functions and have benefits for the organism prior to all the parts being there in one spot. One of the things that you notice about evolutionary theory is that as uh, uh, organisms evolve over time, they utilize all sorts of uh, structures and parts that uh, were uh, used for something different in the past. So there's novel uses for parts and structures uh, in organisms. And we see that very frequently as organisms uh, in, in, are introduced to or encounter uh, new situations, new environments, uh, new uh, other sorts of organisms that they have to interact with. So the bacterial flagellum, for example, uh, can be uh, explained according to evolutionary theory by having an account of how the parts individually could have been beneficial to the organism and then those parts repurposed for uh, this complex structure as the number of parts ended up uh, uh, coming close to what's needed in order for that kind of structure to function properly. Another major assumption of the argument for intelligent design is that fitness always increases as a organism develops or evolves. And that's a mistake. Evolutionary theorists do not assume that fitness always increases. And in fact, there's uh, many examples of fitness decreasing uh, uh, temporarily and then increasing again later on throughout the uh, historical record, throughout the development of life on Earth. So the assumption that unless we can see a step-by-step -step increase of fitness all the way to the construction of an irreducibly complex structure, there's no way for evolutionary theory to explain the development of that structure that assumption is false. It's not part of evolutionary theory at all. So monotonic or strictly increasing uh, fitness is no assumption there whatsoever, but it is an important assumption in the argument for intelligent design, the argument against evolutionary theory.